Well, greetings and welcome to the dividing line. Uh, we're going to be a little short today. Um, I don't mean like that. Uh, probably about eight minutes short, something like that. Might as well go ahead and share the story here. Uh, there's a bunch of you in the audience. You're not necessarily the biggest social media folks, but um, you're regular listeners and supporters and things like that. Um, <laughs> Aging comes at you slowly, you know, and well, and then and then things can happen fast, but certain things happen slowly. And I came to the realization recently that the main word that I was saying to my dear wife of more than 42 years was what? What? And and so we started having a debate as to whether she's become a mumbler or I need hearing aids. Um, and, I, you know, I never went... The first musical concert I ever went to was after Kelly and I were married. Um, and it was Barry Manilow. <laughs> okay, so we're not... So, you know... I mean, I have been to a couple of skillet concerts now, but I always had ear, hearing protection. So I just wasn't one of those people. You know, I expect my son, you know, to be deaf by like next year. Well, he's going to be 40 in two years. So I expect by then I'm going to have to show him how to use hearing aids and everything else. Um, but uh, no, I. So I, I, I made an appointment. And my GP, my regular doctor guy who I haven't seen for years and years, but anyway, um, they have an audiologist that comes in on Tuesdays every other week. And, you know, as I look back, like when I had the debate with Alex Drado, which I really enjoyed, Alex is a great guy. Uh, I was struggling and I just chalked it up to normally the, the, all the speakers are aimed that direction. They don't remember to have a fold back heading toward us. And so when the other guy's talking, he's projecting that direction. And, you know, there have been lots of times, even when I was in my 30s, that it was hard to hear what the other guy was saying. So I just didn't really think about it too much. So I had my hearing test this morning, and I have moderate hearing loss. Um, and it's right in the range where uh, the human voice, where the, the distinctive sounds of the human voice are to be found. And so we, uh, I contacted uh, health insurance, which who don't like me for some reason this year, since I've had four surgeries this year, four times out like a light, four surgeries. Um, and my uh, deductible has been completely paid off, but they don't, it's, uh, I guess the way we'd, we'd put it, given how I'm treated now on social media is I don't have boomer insurance um, and they don't cover hearing aids. So it's all out of pocket. It's uh, it's not cheap. Um, and uh, but I'm like, I'm I've got a debate coming up. And um, in fact, I just because I've always been doing this off the top of my head. But and I, I sent I forwarded this to you, right? Okay, you got it? All right. Um, oh, drat. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I want to read this to you. I want to read you the uh, specific thesis statement. Uh, and this is... I'm looking forward to this, but to connect to what I was just saying, I need to be able to hear what the other guy's saying. <laughs> uh, because, I mean... That is something that, and and you know what? I'm just I'm just sitting here thinking. Um, one of the one of the first, the only time I ever spoke to John Gerstner, uh, because of Jerry Matatix's conversion, as so of this was ninety. Wow. Probably ninety one. Yeah, so it's probably about thirty three years ago. Uh, one of the reasons he really wanted to respond to Jerry and stuff. And then, and I was having a, whole, a really hard time talking to him on the phone. His hearing was really bad. 
And he eventually said, you know what? He says, as much as I would love to debate him, I just can't hear. I, I, I can't, I, I'm just, I don't, I can't do it anymore. And so I, I'm just thinking about that going, that was a third of a century ago. That was a third of a century ago. <laughs> so anyway, uh, all of that to say that um, the kind audiologist lady that I met with this morning, she normally leaves from the office in 54 minutes, but she's going to stay around and it's not that far of a drive from here over there. Um, and so we're going to wrap up a little early just so I can shoot over there and she's going to get me fitted and we'll get these things ordered. I don't know how long it's going to take, but hopefully have them in time oh, for the trip to Mobile and a new part of life. So, so I'm just going to be getting up in the morning and putting my, <laughs> my, my click reading, reading glasses around my neck, putting my ear. My 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 favorite movie's gonna be uh, up, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, and because that that guy he was still he was ready to go even much older than me. But uh, anyways, so yeah, there we <laughs> there we are. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, um, wow, so much. Oh, so here's the thesis. Here is the thesis statement. I'm really looking forward to this. And I want to um, thank Tom Riello, uh, who is the former ordained PCA minister, now Roman Catholic, um, who we're, who's, I'm going to be debating. And he, this is the res, this is the resolution he provided. I never would have even suggested this. But this is the resolution he provided. Be it resolved, the true worship of God is nothing less than the self-offering of Christ, which is only offered in the Catholic liturgy. Um, I, <clears throat> I appreciate a Roman Catholic that actually believes what Roman Catholicism teaches. It's much easier to, the, the, the issues are much more clearly delineated in that context than um, dealing with Pope Francis and dealing with the vast majority of people at Boston College or something like that that are just out there in, in left field someplace, even though Rome never gets rid of those people, uh, almost never gets rid of those people. Well, let's put it this way. Francis is much faster to get rid of conservatives than he is those people. Um, but yeah, there's uh, the true worship of God is nothing less than the self-offering of Christ, which is only offered in the Catholic liturgy. So I'm looking forward to that. And uh, I just sent the graphics for the debate to Rich, so we'll be putting those up on the website, up on the app. I'll uh, hopefully this evening uh, get them up onto social media and stuff like that. So those of you in the Mobile area, uh, this will be the weekend, uh, the last weekend in October. Um, so I'll be leaving like the 15th, 16th, something like that of October. Uh, we'll pick up the, the RV and uh, start heading across lots of interesting roads, including Louisiana. <laughs> uh. If you've ever driven the roads in Louisiana, you, everybody in Louisiana is sitting there going, yep, 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 we know. <laughs> we know. We know what's exactly what you're talking about. Uh, yeah, it's uh, there, there's a reason why we just spent, I'm not sure how many hundreds of dollars, having the bearings repacked uh, on the RV. Uh, because I have to drive through places like New Mexico and Louisiana and Southern Missouri. And uh, there are some... Some great places uh, that you have to drive. But, you know, it's interesting. I think, <clears throat> is it Alabama? There's a north-south route that I've taken when I come back from Atlanta that takes me down toward Louisiana. 
And that is one of the smoothest highways I've ever been on. It's like, well, okay, I'll I'll take I'll take what I can take when I can take it. All right. So that's where so we're gonna get done a little bit earlier. Maybe we'll see. Um prayers for that uh trip. And uh and that's where that's where we are there. So um I'm just moving stuff around here. Uh and uh wow, what where do I even start? Let me start here, because <clears throat> it's the main thing on my mind. There is a um, debate challenge out there. I, I don't know where all this is coming from, but over the past few days, you all know from last week that the issue of crusaderism came up. And it's not that this is brand new. Um, it's been what, six, seven, eight months since you started seeing all this, I started seeing all these crusader images and, you know, I, I knew of a couple of the books that had come out over the past six, or seven years, mainly because I deal dealt more when I was traveling overseas than I have recently with Islam. And so I'm interacting with a lot of the material in that area. And so I was aware of that stuff, but that was before all the Christian nationalism stuff. This is a form of crusaderism connected to Christian nationalism. And so, talked about it in the last program, and, you know, I've made some comments since then, and so all of a sudden, the guys up at Canon want me to have a dialogue with Raymond Ibrahim on the Crusades. And I'm like, about what? 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 I mean, I don't know his theology at all. I can't really tell what it is. I don't know the man, never met him, but I don't know what his theology is. And my theology is well known. And in fact, one of the things I'm getting uh, a lot of criticism for uh, is that I'm right where I was 30 years ago with, you know, with with some exceptions. I mean, I actually have an eschatology now and I'm not a, I'm not a pan millennialist. Uh, It'll all pan out in the end. Um, Like some people within 30 feet of me. Um, But But as far as the sovereignty of God, Trinity, scriptural sufficiency, inerrancy, all that stuff, I'm I'm a stick in the mud because um, I've never been given a reason not to be, basically. And I've, whenever I've used the term reformed, I've always done it because I was convinced that that is the teaching of scripture not not because this council said or that council said it or this that or the other my favorite theologian over here my favorite theologian. you know every favorite theologian i've ever had i've had disagreements with at one point or another no problem no worries but anyway uh so i'm like what are we supposed to be talking about and and i've also asked and that's sort of where things sit right now what's the time frame because my the, the feeling I got was they're actually going to have him up in Moscow. And, and I couldn't be there. Um, I, I don't, I can't sneak a entire trip up to Idaho and back into this fall because once I head for Mobile, I've only got like two and a half weeks between that trip and the trip to St. Charles in early December and prior. So, What's the time frame? What are we talking about? But the main thing is, what would be the what would the discussion be about? Because everything that I've said, not sure, I've said lots of the, I've said, said lots of historical things about the Crusades. There is a context in which they took place, and <clears throat> there is a context amongst, you know, uh, the Pope, 
was um, up against the wall, shall we say. There was division. Uh, the calling of the First Crusade helped to unite Europe and to solidify his position. And the papacy had just come out of the pornocracy in the preceding centuries. And there's all sorts of stuff going on uh, in, um, in medieval Europe at that particular point in time. And the same thing was going on amongst the Muslims. There was the, the Muslim caliphate was splintered and fractured and uh, Sunnis and Shias. And um, in fact, the only reason the First Crusade was able to take Jerusalem was because of the division of the Muslim forces. They, they were not united. If they had been united, we saw what happened to the Third Crusade because of that. So, um, so there's a lot. So, so yeah, you know the the fact that, and this is by the way something that comes up in the um, a lot of the conversations. Uh, the fact that the Pope had to demonize Muslims. The reason he had to do that is because the Muslims were not at that point in time a threat to Europe. They weren't. They weren't invading. They weren't trying to, they, they, they weren't. They were divided. They were fighting each other. That is a regular aspect of Islamic experience. Uh, I've said that for a long time, that one of the reasons I'm not one of the people running around going, the, the, the Muslims are going to take over. As soon as the Muslims get a certain level of power, you know what they do? They turn on each other. They turn on each other. Uh, history is filled with it. Um, and so, <clears throat> anyway... Uh, so I do talk about historical things uh, that are that are relevant, but my entire concern has been theological. It's been based upon the falsehood of the claims of of the Bishop of Rome. It's been faced. It's been based upon the the falsehood that that the Bishop of Rome can offer salvation to anyone. He's not in control of that. There are no keys to control God's grace. There's no such thing as an indulgence. Um, none of this stuff is biblical. And then, of course, the heartbreaking thing for me, and man, has this been a confirmation of my worst nightmares, the attitude that I have seen amongst young Christian men toward Muslims as a whole has just been heartbreaking. It's no wonder we're making no impact amongst Muslims as far as seriously evangelizing them. Oh, sure. I Believe me, I, <laughs> I know a lot of the people that are, but they're not a part of this stuff. They're, they're not, they're not, they're not uh, lionizing the Crusades. They, they're not. So, so my question to the guys, well, what's, what will we be discussing? So in the midst of all of that comes the Stephen Wolf stuff. Now, Stephen Wolf wrote the book published by Canon Press. And I am thankful that at least up to this point in time, uh, all this stuff is still available for people to check out on their own. I have objected to Stephen Wolf's position from the time the book came out. And my objections have become more pointed, but from the beginning, from the first conversation that Doug Wilson and I had on the first sweater vest dialogue, what has been my concern? What have I, what have I consistently said from the start? Sacralism, the violation of the sphere, sovereignty, family, church, state. That's what, that was the quote unquote problem with Christendom 1.0, it created nominalism. It created people who were hardened to the gospel because they had been offered salvation in other ways. Um, and it created uh, the burning of Miguel Cervetus in Geneva. And I've defended, I've defended Calvin against the egregiously stupid versions of that. But I've never said that it was right that that would happen. 
And so the I've said, and all you have to do is ask the folks who uh, went to Germany with me in 2017, um, and I shocked them and our tour guides uh, the first night in Berlin. I said, look, I know that a lot of the people we're going to be studying would would never have extended the right hand of fellowship to us. They would have, they would have minimally exiled us from their cities and maximally would have burned us or drowned us. And everybody was like, huh? What? <laughs> and that, that, their what was not because of hearing loss. <laughs> it was shock. Really? And so the, the whole trip, I had to undo a lot of bad Christian history that created a cartoon version of the Reformers. The Reformers were coming out of a sacral system. It took generations until that sacralism was broken down. But that's a good thing that it was. And so, you know, Doug and I had a conversation. You know, Doug, has, Doug has even said, a blog, a May blog, in, in Christendom as I understand it, uh, James White would not have to worry about being drowned. Okay. Why? On what, on what foundation? Let me just give you um, a couple of, of tweets from the past couple of days. James White and Douglas Wilson are apostate liars who deny the murder of Christ by the Jews and backstab our forefathers. Under Christian nationalism, they will be silenced for their false witness and blasphemy. Do you, do you think what he means by that is that we'll have our Twitter privileges suspended? Maybe? Yeah, I, you know, under Christian nationalism, they will be silenced for their false witness and blasphemy. Hmm. Uh, another guy uh, today uh, said to me, productive comment, everything you disagree with is lunacy. Your generation caused the mess the world is in today. There is this whole, and, and there are people, we know that one of the strategies of the left is to divide a people. A divided people are easily conquered. And this nation is completely divided. Jesus said a house divided against itself cannot stand. It's not going to. We are falling. There's no question about it. Um, what's happening in Aurora, Chicago, Mexico is now going to give free bus rides to anybody who wants to invade our country. Uh, and our current leaders will invite them in and give them your tax dollars uh, and give them more money than you have. Uh, that's, that's, we, are in, we are watching the self-suicide of the United States. That's all there is to it. Um, and so we have all this stuff. We, and... and Another guy, again, red avatar, blue eyes. Based is actually short for based on the Holy Scriptures. I'm not sure if that is, but okay. A guy asks, so killing Jews is based? You have to have meant that in response from the context of White's post. Because I was talking about how Peter the Hermit, 20,000 people before the First Crusade start marching toward Jerusalem. They get wiped out by the Turks because they're idiots. But along the way, what are they doing? They're massacring Jews. They're massacring Jews. And ha when I posted that, I did not see a single person who said, what a tragedy. What a horrible blight upon the gospel. But I saw plenty of these young Christian nationalist guys with red avatars and blue eyes saying, quote, Executing wicked pagans is well within the bounds of a Christian prince's jurisdiction. Executing wicked pagans is well within the bounds of a Christian prince's just jurisdiction. I don't know about the rest of you. I I wasn't <clears throat> I wasn't hearing people uh, talking about Christian princes and things like that. But I know that Stephen Wolf's book does. So, 
Stephen Wolf pops onto Twitter. Uh, I don't think I've had a single positive, uplifting exchange with Stephen Wolf. Not once. And so we are not exactly best buds by any stretch of the imagination. And so he says on Twitter that he would gladly, in a public debate... Now, what was funny was... Here's what, he's, here's what he said. <clears throat> James, I'd love to have a discussion with you on whether... Oh, no, that's that's a different one. Because he's a couple things. Uh, where'd it go? There. James, I would love to... Def- I would love to defend the Reformation before a live audience in formal debate against you. James, I would love to defend the Reformation before a live audience in formal debate against you. So, here is my response. <clears throat> and by the way, so, so he's the one who is placing this in the idea that I'm attacking the Reformation. He's the defender of the Reformation. So he is presenting himself as the defender of the Reformation. Okay, keep that in mind with my response, because all sorts of, you're so arrogant. He's the one presenting himself as the defender of the Reformation. Now, someone's going to come up and say, I'm going to defend the Reformation. I think I have the right to say, show us your receipts. How long have you been doing this? How long have you been doing this? Because I've been doing it for a long time. It doesn't make me right, but I think I have the ground to say I have been defending Reformed theology from the time that he was probably about eight years old. Right? Doesn't make me right, but that's the truth. Here's what I said. What exactly are you intent upon defending, sir? To mystic categories of theology? He's a Thomist. The confusion of state and church? He's a sacralist. Execution of heretics? What exactly do you think you would be defending when you defend the Reformation? Because this is the issue. You see, all the people who popped off with all the arrogant comments just didn't even hear what I was talking about. That's what happens on social media these days. I said, what exactly do you think you would be defending when you defend the Reformation? And could you send me links to your debates with Roman Catholics where you defended the Reformation? Or is the first defense of the Reformation you can make against me? What debates have you done? I said, I have missed those. Please send me your debates defending the kingly freedom of God in salvation, election, and predestination. Also, I am sure you have many defending sola scriptura, sola fide, sola gratia, yes? I would like to see them. And surely you have defended the once-for-allness of the atonement against Rome's apologists for the Mass. In fact, I'll be debating a former Presbyterian minister on that very topic in just a matter of weeks. I look forward to seeing your work on that topic as well. Now, why would I do that? Oh, because you're arrogant and because you're old and you're making people feel bad. No, that's not why. And if that's what you thought, you're not a deep thinker. You're just, you're just, you're not even listening. You're not thinking about what's going on. And that probably means you're very easily swayed by emotional stuff rather than serious stuff, serious thought. And that means probably five years from now, you're going to have a completely different set of beliefs than you have today because you're not grounded, you're not based, whatever term that actually is supposed to be referring to. Why do I ask those questions? Real simple. What defines the Reformation? What defines the Reformation? Again, Ain't the first time I've had this debate either. Not the first time we've talked about these things. It's the first time in a context like this with someone pushing something called Christian nationalism and Christian princes and sacralism and natural law and who opposes post-millennialism, theonomy, presuppositionalism and says all of them are inconsistent with the Reformation. Why? How are you defining the Reformation? What defines the Reformation? And I would say to you, the Reformation should be defined as it, if it's to have relevance today, 
it should be defined, it's doctrine of God. It's doctrine of God's sovereign, kingly decree. Divine election and predestination. Everything that the solas mean. So, justification, the imputed righteousness of Christ, faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone, if you want to throw in all of the debates on Mary and the saints and intercession and all the things that go along with that. Um, especially sola scriptura. Done that one a few times. The sufficiency of Scripture, directly related, but that's directly related to Thomistic stuff, natural theology, uh, a rejection of presuppositionalism, all those go hand in hand. So the, the point is that, and I haven't gotten any responses to this yet, the point is, how do you define the Reformation? What are you going to be defending? Are you going to be defending the sacralist orientation of the reformers i admit that and admit that it was an error oh see i win well okay good are you going to drown me now you know uh gonna gonna do gonna take me to zurich and give me my third baptism how about throwing me in the in the in the prison at the castle i you know these are all things we've talked about many 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 times before and they're all based on sacralism. They're all based on sacralism. Are you, you going to do what Luther did? Are you, you going to do what Zwingli did? Are you going to actually defend those things as good and proper things? So, so I guess the idea would then be, yes, and the fact that their, their uh, followers moved away from that is why we have where we are today. I, I'll bet you dollars to donuts. That's the idea. See, that made room for secularism. No, I didn't. If obeying Christ's commands in Scripture and abandoning centuries and centuries, a millennia of man-made human tradition means you're actually abandoning the Reformation, then it's time to abandon the Reformation. That's not what it means, of course, but if that's where you're standing, then that's what you need to do. What this has illustrated yet again, and man, I'll tell you, the past four years... <laughs> What have we come to understand? Um, that there is a vast chasm between being reformed because you're a biblicist and being reformed because you're a traditionalist. Vast difference. I have defended reformed theology on what defines the Reformation biblically because I can't defend sacralism to mystic categories, natural law categories, um, all that kind of stuff, biblically. Because it it's opposed to the Bible's teaching about man's fallen state and, you know, all the errors that Thomas made along those lines, which, you know, he was the inheritor of all these traditions, and so he was stuck with them. So there you go. Um, <clears throat> but I'm a biblicist. And you know what? When it all comes flying apart, in Western culture, which it's going to. It's happening fast. It's happening real fast. When it all comes flying apart, and we can't have these debates and conversations anymore because we're no longer allowed to communicate with one another. Or the grid just won't, you know, we don't have enough electricity. Um, when that all happens, the people who are convinced that what we believe has been revealed by God in his unchanging word. And I believe Christ's sheep hear his voice and they love his voice and they will die rather than deny his voice. The people whose foundation is grounded in the scriptures as the final source of authority will be the ones who will endure 
and who will be there to start rebuilding. And the ones whose theology and foundation has been the traditions of men won't. Won't. So that's one of the glorious things when you teach people how to study the Word of God, why to believe in the Word of God, and what the Word of God teaches, you've accomplished your task. You can die happy. You can trust the Spirit of God to take that and to apply it. That's that's my joy. That's, you know, my body ain't doing, what, doing, doing the same stuff it was doing 10 years ago, and so when it decides just up and quit on me, of, you know, as you're laying there, those last breaths, what are you going to be thinking? What have you done in your life that will last? And I say, if you ground people in the scriptures, the way that Jesus believed the scriptures, if you teach them and you give them the tools to defend Jesus' own view of the scriptures, you've done more for people than you could doing anything else. That will have the longest lasting impact. That's what we're trying to do. So, uh, real quick, uh, but I'm not even sure. Oh, hold on a second. Oh, Richard Barcelos has decided to jump into it. I didn't know about that. Huh. Okay. Bringing it up here real quick. Troublemaker in uh, North Phoenix. Uh, doesn't want to pop up. Okay, that's great. He said the Reformation, the debate hasn't even been agreed upon. Duh. Why ask these questions here? Just explained it. Also, whether he has done... Public debates on this or other issues shouldn't be a game stopper, and the fact that you you have doesn't necessarily entail anything. Well, Richard, um, brother, love you. I just don't know where you've gone over the past number of years. And I just explained. I mean, everything you said in there, I just explained. Are we having net problems? Okay. That's what I thought. We've, we're, we're recording, so we'll get it posted up there. Sorry about that, folks. Um... So that's why it wouldn't pull up is we've just lost. That's happening a lot down here. That concerns me in doing any type of debates or things like that because we're just Yeah, we need to we need to get that fixed. Um but Richard um I've answered everything you said there. How do you define the reformation? What's it about? Um and I would have thought brother that you would have seen that, but you've changed you changed a lot, and that's uh, saddening to me. Um, you know what? What I was going to do is I was going to um, play A.D. Robles. He did four... And by the way, brother, when you when you record videos like this, if you if you hold the phone down like this, it makes your nose look like you're Jimmy Durante. Okay, I just just out of love. You don't you don't want to put it, your angles all wrong, bro. <laughs> just all wrong. But he he recorded four thoughts on the crusade stuff, and so I put them all into one file. And what I was gonna do is I was going to live play them and respond to them. We're back. Um, the problem is I've only got about 10 minutes. So, um, sorry about the, we're having net issues down here. Um, we may we may have to uh, bring Starlink over and stick it on the roof. <laughs> it's just, it, it works, man. That's just, it, and we know exactly what size drill bit to use to put, <laughs> drill through the wall to put it through because we just we just drilled a hole in our RV to uh, use Starlink. But anyways, well we didn't do it. We had the we had the professionals do it. 
shall we say. So <clears throat> my, my concern is if I start, I, I'm going to have to continue it on. Um, and, and I just don't know if that's the way to do it. So how about I, I just keep it queued up here and we just plan on doing another program to catch all that stuff. I'm trying to remember my, I've got some other things going on uh, this week and trying to remember what they are. Um, yeah, I've got a, uh, okay. On a Thursday, I'm doing David Wheaton's show from 12 to one. And so we'll do the program after that. And I will play, I will live, I will listen for the first time to what A.D. Robles says um, and we'll live respond to it. And we'll, we'll do that on Thursday. I'm not going to try to cram it in here. Uh, part of me, part of my thinking here is if this uh, audiologist that I met with this morning is kind enough to stick around to wait for me. And she had even said that her son has a, like a football game or a soccer game or something this afternoon. And I'm like, Okay, make me feel even more guilty. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap things up here and head over there so that she can get out on on time and and I I just I just I don't know why I was raised that way. I'm early for dental appointments. Boomers, yeah, it's boomers. Bo boomers were just. In fact, I've been told that's white supremacy. Yeah, being on time is white supremacy. Oh, I've, you've not seen that. Oh yes, that's that was uh, last two years ago. There was this big thing that listed signs of white supremacy, and insisting on being on time, like to work and stuff like that. That's that's white supremacy. I just thought it was not getting fired. <laughs> I, I just thought it was just not being mean and nasty to other people. That's why you hold doors and do things like that and say sir and ma'am and stuff that you don't do anymore. It was called common courtesy at, at one at one point. Yeah, so. Anyway, sorry about the glitch on the uh, the thing there, but we will uh, soldier on with that uh, on Thursday and uh, pray for us, pray for the upcoming debate, and we'll see you next time on The Dividing Line. Thanks for watching. God bless.